All right, we're live here with uh, my Twitter friend, my brother in the Twitterverse, Christopher Hudson, so that I don't butcher any introductions. I'll, I'll try to use the ones that he uses himself, and I'll always allow him to correct me if I'm wrong. Industrial and Organizational Psychology Master of Science. Uh, I see the Puerto Rican flag, vegan, libertarian, and he slash him. I hope that's a, a gracious enough introduction and uh, welcome. Sure, that works for me. Yeah. Uh, my friends call me Chris, just if that's easier, but Chris, you know, okay. Perfect. Also work. Yeah, there are trouble. I'm usually Christopher. <laughs> okay, I don't want you to be in trouble, so I'll, I'll refrain from the Christopher. There, there's so many awesome topics, so we're probably going to have to have you as a repeat guest as long as you're willing and have the time. L let's start with something that happened recently that I, I found very interesting. You, you did. I don't know if it was a follow Friday, but it was definitely in the tradition of that type of thing. You, you boosted my voice along with a number of other voices, and I'm very appreciative of of that. You know, you didn't have to do that. Nobody's making you do that or twisting your arm in, in any way. And I was curious, you know, uh, what goes behind the thinking of that? I think you used something along the phrase of uh, decolonizing your liberty, Twitter, something like that. I, I may have that a little off. Yeah, I think that was right. Um, you know, maybe that wasn't the best choice of words, but I was sort of inspired because, um, you know, Follow Friday, something that kind of just died off, it seems like, in Twitter, mm -hmm. but I, I used to always like it. Um, that was usually how I found sort of interesting uh, accounts, except for getting like a million notifications when everyone just like <laughs> thank you or whatever. But um, I, I sort of, you know, I saw people like kind of groups like explicitly like non political groups, like, or accounts, um, sort of using that terminology to like promote, I don't know, like, mostly black, but also like indigenous, um, uh, like a good example is like, like vegan, um, either vegan uh, places to eat or mm -hmm. um, food producers or whatever. And like, that's something that interests me. It's not like obviously political, but I was like, oh, I didn't even know about some of these things. And uh, as someone who kind of thinks like a lot of our disagreements or like problems, um, I don't know if most, but a lot of it, it is just like an information problem. Mm -hmm. um, I find things like that really valuable. And so that was something that was like one inspiration um, for what I did. And then also like it, it, it also stemmed from maybe a little bit of frustration um, between what I see as like two camps, wh which is like people who say, or assume like there are no black libertarians mm -hmm. um, and or that they they're not legitimately black if they're libertarians so almost like that seems to also be implied that's uh, similar mm -hmm. with like black conservatives um, and then also uh, I think and I'm sure this exists I'm sure this isn't like unique to libertarians but like libertarians who seem to want to i'm trying to think of like the polite wording for this but like oh go ahead you could be I, I polite adopt, or impolite i i won't mind maybe they will or maybe you will but i, I won't mind so adopt, don't worry about my sake adopt or promote or single out women or minority fill in the blank people only when they fall in lockstep with their like preconceived notions of libertarianism like they want them to in like many cases they want they always like have to downplay like play the libertarian angle if that makes any sense it, it does. It's like a, a stamp of a, approval. I mean, we can give the classic case. This is not a libertarian case at all, but just, um, you know, the tokenization effect that we see with Donald Trump and Kanye West in the Oval Office. What I see when I see something like that, um, 
you know, and I don't immediately just, you know, demonize the one or the other one, you know, one happens to have released one of my favorite albums of all time. So that's uh, maybe part of my cognitive dissonance, even if I disagree with a lot of the things he's spewing. But what I see from there is that like President Obama kind of, uh, you know, wrote him off as a total clown and didn't want to even give him the time of day. And even if he knows he's being used by Trump, uh, President Trump for like a, an agenda to say like, oh, look, black people like me, like, you know what I mean? To have that effect that you're talking about to stamp him as like pro-black somehow, it, you know, in opposition to a lot of the other things that are very obvious that he's been doing. Um, Trump at least gave him that time of day and like took up, you know, the the pictures with him and all that. And so I I, I see I see what you're talking about in other spaces as well. That's actually a good, I actually didn't think about that. That's actually a good example because I think, uh, I don't know Trump's motivation. I'm sure Trump's motivations were just Trump centric. Um, <laughs> I, don't feel like that's, I don't feel like that's like a controversial thing to say, but I never really, my opinion about like Kanye West and like his politics has like evolved a bit. And I, I don't doubt like his sincerity and mm -hmm. I don't doubt his, um, I feel like this term doesn't really encompass like the spirit of what I mean, but like, I don't think Kanye West, like, felt like he was compromising like his beliefs or his pro-blackness uh, mm -hmm. by like adopting political coalitions or a political position. I, I, I don't, I see someone like Kanye West as like categorically different. Um, and I think even though I don't really care for Kanye West, like a good example compared to someone like say Candace Owens. Oh yeah. I think, and not just because I disagree with her, but because I think, like, is someone who, like, seems to be, like, intentionally dishonest to more, like, score political points for a team. And so she's, like, tokenized and adopted by a team as a bludgeon against, like, the opposing team, specifically the opposing team's, like, Black constituents. Um, that, that, at least that's how it appears to me, like, the difference between someone like Candace Owens and Kanye West. I agree. The only thing I would ever commend her on is how she took the, I don't know if you watched Dave Chappelle's recent stand up commentary. He, you know, he really drove some points in against her and the way she took that, like there are a lot of people who just Pretty do well. not understand. Yeah. They don't understand the Streisand effect. And I think that being maybe a younger person hip to the internet culture a little, I think she understood the Streisand effect and, and didn't try to like, you know, dodge it. Like she took that punch, you know, uh, yeah, and it was a strong comedic off, punch. More or less. Yeah, yeah exactly. That was, that was like a wise, and you know, who knows, like, I, I don't, I'm not a mind reader. Like mm -hmm. I hate just like calling people disingenuous. That's just how she seems to me based on her history. Mm -hmm. But it, it was like an example like that, that it's like hard to know, was this like strategic, just like part of your whole marketing persona, or is this actually like the real genuine you kind of coming through? Cause you like, you know, you know, this is like, it's a comedian, it's a joke, I admire, you know, who knows? Uh, it's probably not fair for me to like speculate that much on that because I'm not a mind reader. I, I appreciate that, man. You're, you're so intentional and, and careful um, with your words. And I, I appreciate that. You know, my dad taught me from a young age, like think before you speak. And, and I see that um, to, to take it, in a slightly different direction, but I, I think it's a relatively good segue. You know, we're talking about not trying to diagnose or psychologize people, which is typically, you know, the route of a, of a clinical psychologist in one-on-one -on -one or small group settings rather than, you know, a public forums of debate. Um, you studied industrial organizational psychology, which might be a mouthful for some people who are not accustomed to it. But uh, as I told you off camera, I've, I've got a, a friend of mine who graduated uh, from that in, in L.A. And, and now he's back to where he was born and raised in, in Ethiopia. And he's working in that in that field. And and I've heard the Libertarian Party candidate for 2020, Joe Jorgensen, kind of talk about this. What can you tell us about industrial organizational psychology and, and where where it fits in the milieu? And I don't want to color your commentary too much, but one of the things I find interesting is like, um, you, that you have a master of science as opposed to a master of arts, which is something in, in my own field of dispute resolution. I had looked into the differences. So 
wondering if you could talk about any, any anything there. And, and I'm not supposing or, or trying to put you on a pedestal as, you know, the chief expert on the subject, but someone who's got valid experience in, in the field and whose voice I'd love to hear. Sure. So like the the uh, the sales pitch is that industrial or, or industrial organizational psychology, uh, the shorthand being IO psychology, is the study of humans in the workplace. And sort of if that seems overly broad, like that's intentional because there's a lot, even though IO seems to get very little attention uh, when people think of like the umbrella of psychology, IO encompasses like arguably half of what humans do. Um, so everything from, you know, something as like, something as like simple as like comp and benefits and like how those work um, to something more large scale like organizational change and mergers. Those are all things that like IOs are concerned with um, and study to like varying degrees. Uh, I, I, I don't know how much clarity I can give to the like masters of science versus masters of arts distinction. Mm -hmm. I honestly don't know the history between like how those are even assigned or if how meaningful they really are. But I will say that IO is definitely like intentionally like science focused. Um, most schools you're getting some kind of like science practitioner, maybe one leaning more one end than the other, but usually at least a blend of like science practitioner training where you are trained to do research specifically mm -hmm. like in, in like to understand statistics. Um, and then oh, that's what I was going to ask, like in a natural science or in like math. So it's like more math or is it like biology or chemistry or physics somehow? Like I would say it's still a social science. It's, 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 it's not like the natural sciences, but it, I mean, you, it, it's definitely still like relying. I mean, even the social science, any kind of science, including social science, even though I think a lot of people have like a warped view on what social science actually is. Um, you know, you, you still have to like, um, I mean, you still have to know statistics, you have mm -hmm. to know like regression analysis, um, you know, it, uh, social science will sometimes not seem as sexy or as clear as like some of the other hard sciences, but, mm -hmm. um, that's just because humans are more complicated. It's like, just because they're more complicated to study and we should be more humble about our, um, our results and like what we what we deduce from them doesn't mean that humans are like off limits or like not worth like investigating. That That's a solid point. I see that defeatist attitude a lot. I didn't understand a lot of the like categories of knowledge until I began working in universities, first in North Dakota, later in, in Merced in Central California. And even this basic division of like humanities, social sciences, and then natural sciences. I didn't, I didn't really understand it. And then, you know, with some of the, the university, like culture wars that would happen. And then, you know, the offices I would work in as a informal channel for people to, to manage conflict. I would see a lot of these things and it, it start, I started to see trends and patterns and I, I didn't realize certain things. So the context in which I was asking about the, the MA versus the MS is like, I, you know, I got an MA in dispute resolution and I had seen different MS programs and we didn't really have stats at all. I took stats in undergrad, but we didn't have stats in our program and they call it, you know, interdisciplinary or, or cross disciplinary, but oftentimes it would just be like different categories of humanities studies that would be incorporated with the social science as opposed to the social science, you know, mixing with math or mixing with, um, with something else. And I, I don't know about psychology, but at least from my, my personal kind of clinical experience, what I saw is that there was some um, antagonism or tension between the cultural anthropologists and then the anthropologist who would study like biology or or evolution and th that's what I was kind of wondering was was there any such you know tension or or difference in in terms of research and, and output and, and knowledge production and stuff like that so I'm sure there is like I don't I think like my experience might not be generalizable because the mm -hmm. master the like the we were sort of like rivaled against ecologists so we were all sort of like on the more research like science end of the spectrum mm -hmm. um you know and and we were like doing such different things there wasn't really time or even like <laughs> the like ability to like find our rivalry if that makes any sense 
Uh, I like that. But, yeah, you're focused. But, uh, but yeah, but you know, I'm sure, I'm sure there is. Um, I think it's like, it's probably not like as significant in psychology because my impression is because like something like clinical psychology like dominates like the public persona. Um, mm -hmm. Like there's just not the um, there's just not the numbers to compete like to have like any significant rivalry. Is that like that was my experience yeah. at least like in undergrad. So if there were if like maybe the numbers are more equal um, then maybe, but um, that makes sense. Like a lay person picking up a pop psych book, probably picking up a pop clinical psych, not a pop IO psych. Right, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, I, 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 IOs are often like not really included in the table at all for psychology. Sometimes it's just like a throwaway. Like if you get an intro to psych class, like if you're lucky, you'll get a chapter mm -hmm. on IO, even though, again, like it arguably encompasses half of what humans do, which is working. Um, I think it's just so, it, it just seems so like weird or alien to, um, I think the average person like getting into psychology who thinks it's like, oh, I just like talking to people, even though like what you're probably going to be doing is a lot of math, uh, yeah. and the, and the public persona who think of like, for like their their perception of psychology is like Freud or these like clinical studies or like again like just sitting and talking to people kind of like 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 basically like a social worker I think like that's mm -hmm. like public um perception and they don't really know like how psychology to be fair like as a larger field has like evolved past these sort of like pseudoscience uh Jordan Peterson um I don't know, methodology into like a much more like standard social science. Oh, that, yeah, <laughs> that that's a good whole other um, topic. I don't know if that's something that you want to talk about more, but obviously, you know, the guy's been a best-selling author and and all that stuff. Uh, is is some are how can I phrase this um, neutrally? Um, is is what he is mostly talking about? things that are minority opinions in the field, his own opinion in the field, or are they commonly accepted things in the field? Because a lot of times the way he presents it is um, not just as like one person's opinion, but as if it's, you know, um, accepted kind of widespread teaching um, amongst researchers and clinicians. So I can say with confidence that the vast majority of what Jordan Peterson says or like claims as authoritative is absolutely fringe mm -hmm. um i mean that my first before i think jordan peterson jordan peterson even gained in popularity like i you know i heard about him i listened to him on a podcast where he sort of i mean you have to you kind of have to have like a, a translator like jordan peterson fans can like translate him and you're like how did you get that so like i i i'm gonna but I would say like, even before I had like an anti-Peterson bias, which I'll admit to having now, mm -hmm. like, you know, Jordan Peterson, like, I mean, he's like, his whole shtick is like Jungian psychology and Jungian archetypes, which is absolutely not mainstream, which is absolutely not uh, taught except for like at explicit, like maybe um, Jungian classes or in Jungian journals where Jungians peer review it. I mean, it, it, the Jungian psychology like is considered pseudoscience. Like, by like the for the people who don't know, that's the whole thing about archetypes and the instantiation of like right. these archetypes in the world. Right. No, exactly. I mean, like everything about that. I mean, like even if you explain it, you're like that just sounds wooey, and that's because it is. Like, and and same with Freud before it, and you know it's not that it didn't have like some value or insight at the time, but it's just like, that is just not what, that is just not what the majority of psychologists, not only like talking about it. It's Sorry, Chris, I think, I think you cut out for a sec. Could you say that again? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. I, w I was just saying like something like, like, uh, Carl Jung, like, or Jungian archetypes, it's not something that psychologists even spend time talking about mm -hmm. because 
to be like geologists talking about like flat earth theory. Yeah. Um, uh, it, and so like, that was like, honestly, like the first alarm bell bell that I was like, what is this? Is this guy, maybe he's, maybe he's not really, maybe he's just sort of like an, in, like taking inspirations from young, but it mm -hmm. seems like, so I'll give an example, like something that I think the general public puts a lot of stake in, but psychologists don't, is something like the, like myers Briggs. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've taken that before. <laughs> yeah, same, and, and it's fun. Like, it, it's fun, and, like, it's, if I'm being honest, like, even mine, like, I felt like, wow, this seems to have, like, at least some level of insight, even though, like, mine keeps changing. Like, I'm one of those people that can't get, like, a consistent result, but... What, uh, what were you, if you don't mind me asking? I think I was INTJ. I was INTP. Uh, but I, I know I... I a couple of letters I switch, um, and it's honestly hard because it's been a while since I've yeah. taken it. Right? I switch between the I and the E. Um, fundamentally, I think an introvert, but it is a spectrum. And I think as right. I grow older, I've, I've pushed myself out of my comfort zone to be more of an E. So depending on if you take like a 20 question version versus a hundred question version, that could change. Like if you <laughs> get one thing off, but, but you're saying that is Jungian and, and proven pseudoscience rather than science? Oh yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely very Jungian and it's like, doesn't, you would have a hard time getting like published in like academic psychology journals that aren't explicitly like Myers-Briggs journals, like, or like, um, uh, because of like the unreliability of the results. Sometimes you can get away with like, just like one of the letters, like mm -hmm. I, introvert, extrovert, but I would say, and this is controversial as well, but less so like most, if you want to like talk about like personality tests, like most psychologists sort of like are invested in like the big five. Yeah, I've heard I've heard of that one. The big five. And I know somebody um, who's way more who's who's also done a lot of research on like the Hartman Hartman values. Um, that's controversial, similar to for reasons that Myers-Briggs is. Mm -hmm. But and the point there isn't necessarily to like degrade those things or but but the point is like if you want uh, like if i'm honest those are not mainstream at least among psychologists but no. they are sort of like mainstream accepted among the public and i think that just like it and and to some level that's a failure on psychologists of like not communicating um in my view of just and i think also my opinion like sort of the ivory tower mentality more generally like not communicating or being unwilling to like communicate or break down like new insider research to like the general population. In terms that they can understand in their own lexicon. Yeah, that's interesting. I wonder if it goes back to your point about how these categories of knowledge are difficult to ascertain when we're throwing it on the lens of humanity as humans, because we're not like third party, we're not outside looking in, we're not aliens, like studying humans, we're humans studying humans. But that doesn't mean, you know, that we write it totally off, we just understand the difference between some of this like qualitative data versus quantitative, and how, you know, dependent upon self awareness and honesty of the people filling out the big five or Hartman or, or Myers-Briggs is, which is why, you know, you might get the, the variance in results or, you know, the lack of replicatability of the, of the studies that you're saying the academic journals would be m more reticent to, to publish these things. I, I'm, I'm interested too, how you mentioned this is like the study of the workplace. And I think we kind of got into it, but how, if at all, does this meld with or intersect with then the libertarianism, you know, that you, you think of and, and espouse in, in terms of different views of the workplace, like in a legal sense, like uh, I think you and I are both fans of, of Kevin Carson, right? And, and some of the, the, the local zoning commercial laws and all, all, all the things that he has shown through his writings have artificially propped up certain types of workplaces over, over others. Right. Yeah. I mean, they, I don't think it was always clear to me how they intersected or, and I think how I see them intersecting has, has shifted or evolved. 
Mm -hmm. but definitely in the way that you know we sort of take uh sort of the status quo for like a better word like for granted and as like the object of study and like the status quo of working is literally changing before our eyes like with covid Amen. um like that's like a great example of like and 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 not necessarily completely yeah. better like uh um, true but like it, it is shifting and it is changing and it's like sort of been forced to and um i think that like should be a wake-up call to people as far as like taking for granted um just like the typical way of doing things of organizing of like both in regards to like efficiency as far as like making profits or to your shareholders but also like in terms of like worker and participatory well-being which i think also matters um regardless of where you fall on like the political spectrum so um i mean those are all inter those are all problems um or those are all questions <laughs> that's a better that i like be addressing that. and i always have been trying because so, so like virtual working isn't new uh, mm -hmm. virtual teams aren't new those have been like kind of trendy things for a while and i have been studying it and like one thing and this isn't something that i'm as caught up in like as i have been and am not an authority to speak about but uh, one thing is that the we tend to resist the assumption that um virtual x um operates the same way as non-virtual X. So like a great example is Teams. So like a lot of the Teams research, you know, if you're even if you really think about it, like a virtual team, I mean, it seems trivially true. Like obviously a virtual team doesn't operate the same way and maybe doesn't have the same characteristics as a non-virtual team. Mm -hmm. But often people still rely uh, on that sort of general non-virtual team research um and build off it when perhaps we should be like starting like from the ground up in a lot of areas where a lot of those um things may not apply strictly because of characteristics or factors that are missing or added in the virtual world um so again something i'm not as well read on as it should be but like the you know a very significant field of study in io is just like groups and teams and the development and diversity of teams and what makes teams productive and what makes teams healthy. And all of that is basically based on assumptions uh, surrounding non-virtual teams in traditional workplaces, like traditionally mm -hmm. structured. Face to face workplaces. in a building, yeah. one right. site usually. And so there, there needs to be, we need to reckon with, you know, the world's changing, changing whether we want to want it to or not, but we have to reckon with the fact that there, there are going to be differences, beneficial, non-beneficial, and that's not, I don't think that's a defeatist position. I think it's just, um, we have to be honest about like what we're studying and what we're looking for in order to, again, like not find utopia, not find like some sort of like utopia, but like uh, create the best like circumstances for the situation we're given. Um, and that's why I think like this is like an appeal to the, science side of IO, but also mm -hmm. like the practitioners who have to work with, you know, managers um, and workplaces and HR, uh, because like that, that has to be, there has to be like a good line of communication and translation there if we're going to, um, you know, create a better, better world sort of more or less. Uh, yeah, I agree. I just one microcosm of what you're saying that I have noticed. I I worked remote. I'm on summer break now. I'm I'm a teacher, so I'm on summer break now. But the past 13 weeks, I've been working remotely, and one of the things is like not just working remotely, but working remotely during a pandemic. People are having to focus on their self care more in in different ways, and one place where I've seen a tension between self care is this idea of the availability of people during a crisis who are continuing to work, but they're working from home. There's this idea that like, since you're working from home, you're going to be just as available as you were here while kind of forgetting that there's this 
traumatic experience and people are going to experience that that trauma and and respond to it in different ways some through you know productivity but you know some need more time and and different spaces to process it so i like i like how you said it's with the theoreticians in research but also in the practitioners who are who are practically giving advice to to the managerial class in in workplaces Hendrik, do you have the ability to pause the recording? Uh, I don't, but I could I could stop it and we could do another one. I don't know if that's too difficult for you. I don't want to be... Uh... No, no, I could stop it. I could stop it. Yeah, so we were just talking about the relationship between IO and the changing workplaces, especially in the remote environment. Um, and, you know, it, it's been fascinating me to, to see, like I said, almost, almost inevitably, like as humans, we're going to come up with different ways of, of finding um, vitriol and all that. And I, and I don't know if this is a good enough segue. You know, I'll let you rate my segues later on. But um one of the things I've observed a lot, and you know, a lot of times I don't just rush to decisions. Like I have debates with myself, like in my head before I even like try to say something. So like I said earlier, I appreciate your intentionality in, in the way that you speak. And, and one of the ways that I see it, not in regards to workplaces and remote, but in this larger libertarian culture that, that I've seen is like, even if some people try to think of libertarianism as apolitical or they think of it like as an entity to itself, it's like some people still have some progressivism or conservatism there with them. And, and I don't know if that ties into like the big five personality um, traits. I remember taking one of those one time and I scored like a hundred on trait openness. And my sister was like, I don't know if that's a good thing, but <laughs> um, that, that's that's why you know I've I've always identified with like the idea of of liberalism. You and I were talking about like you know uh, radical liberalism and 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 how some people use these terms in so many different ways. But like within the libertarian culture, you know, I I see that you know you've displayed, for example, uh, your pronouns in your bio. I I haven't done that. At the same time, I see these other people who that's all they could talk about. And it's like they're they're foaming at their mouth with hatred. And I've done my best to like listen. And I understand like the reason to do this is so that other people don't feel otherized when they're having to present their salient identity um, features. I, the reason I haven't done that is, is personally, I haven't felt the, the conviction to do that but I've at least taken the time to read what people have said, to listen to what people said. And you'll never catch me like getting mad about somebody to do that. That's like the, I think other people have commented on it, like a reverse snowball effect. Like you're trying to say that somebody else is soft and demean them. And, and it, you're showing, you know, how, how brittle your, your own ego or, or self-righteousness is to comment on that. I just, I didn't know if you were comfortable, but just in talking about, what what you see uh, ar ar around that yeah so you're not the only one that um like just addressing the like include the inclusion of pronouns itself like i don't have my opinions on that aren't super strong because you, mm -hmm. you're not the only one i don't even think it's like a lack of conviction for a lot of people like plenty of people with politics that you know are potentially more radical than mine don't necessarily have them in their bio um and i don't know their reasons like and it could just be because like they ran out of room or mm -hmm. they it's just well known where they stand on those things or you know they themselves uh are trans and it's not like again like something well known it's not like necessary for them to um you know do something like that and, and, and plenty of other reasons like, i i i think are legitimate like maybe they you think it's like just like, I don't know, bandwagony, or I don't know, like it's become, I don't know, like, like liberal diversity, in, liberal in like the pejorative sense that I think some people use, even though I don't necessarily agree with that use. Yeah, um, I, I so know I, what you mean. Like Democrat. 
right or like uh i think a lot of radicals i don't want to get distracted from the topic but i think a lot of radicals mm -hmm. use liberal just to mean like like basically like some kind of centrist wishy-washy like compromise with authority reformist sort of all those things combined and that's how that's mm -hmm. how it's traditionally been used by radicals including anarchists and i understand that and i sometimes use it too but i mm -hmm. I, I think we need to be careful not to conflate that with liberalism like as a political philosophy like of pluralism is openism um, yeah is that but, differentiated from neoliberalism i i often refer to that actually as like progressivism you know as it's been defined and kind of the history of it from the you know early 20th century to kind of now so i thought of it as progressivism but i see people you, you know using i had a good friend who used to say that he referred to himself as progressive and you know his enemies as the liberals um, I don't know if that's something you come across or is neoliberal something totally different? Like I know it's normally for like the transnational kind of, uh, um, you know, exported imperial capitalism, but does it make sense in a domestic context too? Is, is that kind of like you're using liberal short for neoliberal or is it different? No, I think maybe some people do. Uh, A bit from now, but or like the backlash to it. But I, I mean, I think I think to a lot of radicals, they're all it's all the same. <laughs> um, as liberal is, it, it, and 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 to be fair, like intentionally so, like mm -hmm. because it's things that are not fascist or reactionary, but are short of radicalism. It's like the bucket of those things, mm -hmm. um, and so that would include sort of like standard conservatism, neoconservatism, um, centrism, neoliberalism, and progressivism. And I think all of those are circles that overlap. So talking about the differentiate, like the distinction between progressivism and neoliberalism, I, I think I'm with you. Like I try to use progressive when I mean something like social democrat. Mm -hmm. uh, I try to, I don't always succeed, but I feel like that that's a more, that's a term that progressives would like the people who subscribe to what I'm critiquing, they would use that term to describe themselves. The, yes. So, and, and um, I like that philosophy describing people in, in terms that they would describe themselves. And I don't hold that dogmatically because if it's just like, you know, uh, right. Orwellian euphemism, you know, where you change the Department of War to the Department of Defense. You know, I, <laughs> I don't know if I buy that as much. And, and I, there's people that maybe hold the label that I don't think legitimately hold it. Like there's people that call themselves libertarians that I don't think legitimately have a right to the label. So there are obviously exceptions to that, but that's, I try to do that. I think that's like a fair reason. Uh, you know, neoliberalism, again, that, that's similar to liberal where there's like the, the pejorative, like the historic, there's like the, the actual, you know, definition of the time from, you know, really it just meant like an updated liberalism. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, everyone from like Milton Friedman or like Janet Yellen seems to fall into it. You know, everyone from Hayek to uh, Keynes seems to fall under neoliberal. So it's just kind of- all Wow. <laughs> Hayek and Keynes? What are yeah. they going to do about their music video challenge? <laughs> right, exactly. I love that video. Uh, but I think, so that's like, you know, this sort of like rediscovery or update of, and I don't know if Hike himself ever referred to him as a neoliberal, but I think some people would at least. Yeah. I, I don't think so. I I've read a, an essay by him where he said, you know, firmly that he's never been conservative, that he was a self-identified socialist until he encountered Mises's ideas. And, you know, Mises himself has the book liberalism. And so he he identified with the with the label, I think, just without without any adjectives, like a, a, a lot of, you know, there's anarchy without adjectives, there's liberalism yeah. without it. That's a good bio. I, I might use that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, there's, so there's that. There's like this like collection. It all, neoliberalism was almost a phenomenon. It's repre it's like supposed to be sort of in, in the history, like a phenomenon and like some historic reform. So I think it also ended up it sort of means that, but then evolved in a more pejorative way to mean like Thatcherism and Reaganism, deregulation, mm -hmm. things like that. So it, it almost then becomes, seems like it becomes conservatism. Yeah. Um, like market, maybe like uh, international conservatism 
and I think in the most sloppy forms, in my opinion, which this is, you know, and I used to use it, but I stopped like the most sloppy forms. It just means like basically everything I don't like, uh, any political or form I don't like is neoliberalism. So yeah. that said, there's been, as I, I'm, you're well aware, I'm sure there's been like a revival of the term neoliberal to actually describe like a specific set of policy positions and values that I am not, I don't consider myself a part of, but consider it, you know, myself friendly with or influenced by, I think a lot of people who identify with the label are smart people or interesting thinkers. Um, and they- Oh, really? Like, I don't think I would be familiar. I, I think I may have seen a Twitter account, but maybe I didn't know if it was satire or real. Um, well, think, could you tell me a little bit about that? And especially uh, yeah. the hearers wouldn't. Well, I can try, I can try. Um, I, I wouldn't be the best since it's not necessarily like my, my group, but yeah, I, I think mm -hmm. it actually did start somewhat satirical of just like, almost like non-socialist social democrats in a lot of ways, or mm -hmm. no center left, kind of like a lot of those kind of people, people who are really like, really wonky kind of folks. And it was like a Twitter, it was a subreddit for a lot of people who, you know, want to talk about economics. That In like economic subreddit, um, so there's like an interesting history there. Uh, like the neoliberal project actually did like a podcast about like the history of like that phenomenon. That's really interesting that I recommend. Um, but yeah, so I think it did start somewhat ironically, and then like there was like a, a couple articles written. Uh, one by Sam, I think Sam Bowman. Um, I think that I remember that being pretty like significant. Where he's like, I'm a neoliberal, and maybe you are too, and it kind of just like it kind of talked about, and obviously he's like a more, like definitely like on the libertarian end, but it was sort of like market reforms, like uh, like pro-market like reforms with like uh, sort of like a utilitarian bent as being consequentialist, pragmatic, um, a working, generous is probably the wrong, wrong word, but like a mm -hmm. working safety net. Um, this, this also happened around the same time as like the Niskanen Center got started, which was like a lot of people who were sort of like liberal libertarians or, you know, again, were like pro-market, but like didn't see, they see the, the regulatory state as separate from the welfare state, which is something I actually I agree. agree. I think that distinction actually is valuable. Um, mm -hmm. When you talk about economic freedom, those things are actually easy to separate. But um <clears throat> So did all these sort of phenomenons happened at the same time, and that sort of like led to the popularity of people who I would describe as like center right to center left, because you have, you know, I think some, again, like sometimes neoliberals include like David Frum. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've seen people saying that that he's becoming a progressive. I was going to say earlier, I didn't want to cut you off though, and, and I see this. Um, I, I primarily thought of this term internationally, things like promoting TPP and NAFTA, things like trying to guarantee that American corporation in Latin America or in Africa is going to get a bid for a contract to remake a place and where, uh, you know, it was destroyed because of U.S. military imperialism. Like, that's what I thought of as neoliberalism. I didn't realize, like, there were domestic projects. And the way you're describing it now, it reminds me of the, the movement that I think was called the Bleeding Heart. Li uh, libertarianism and kind of when I first just started tracking C4 SS, the Center for a Stateless Society, a few years ago, um, when they started using like terms like left libertarian, that's what I thought it meant, you know, was like this bleeding heart um, libertarian as opposed to just like a different emphasis of something that is still securely stateless, something that is like securely anarchic but but that's a good distinction too you made between the bureaucracy and the giving back like i think the way some people in education i know there are a lot of different views on on vouchers but one of the ways that you know i view vouchers in a, in a charitable light is like okay if we agree that we're going to siphon off and, and set apart this amount of money so that nobody sits there and misses out on a quality education due to lack of funds. What if you know each household was given you know that money directly, so that like instead of maybe going to their local public school, they directly hire somebody. And there'd have to be, of course, some oversight. But like, let's say they directly hired somebody 
to work, let's say they have four kids in the house and they directly hire like maybe like an old like school, ancient Greek pedagogue, like you hire someone to homeschool and they're teaching your four or five kids, you know, using what would be essentially like welfare money from the government. And and how would that look different than like a whole apparatus of of managers in a, in a public school setting? So I, I think that's a that's a good distinction to make. And I had no idea that people were referring to that as neoliberal. So I'll have to check it. Was it Bowen you said? Is the, that author? Yes. I, yeah, Sam Bowen wrote an article. And and really just check out the neoliberal project if you're not mm-hmm. following them. I mean, they, they're an official organization now, um, uh, I think, under the Progressive Policy Institute. They, they sort of join together. Um, so they're, I mean, they're an official organization that are worth checking out. It's worth just, you know, seeing who they promote. They have a podcast. Um, again, it's like, it's a broad umbrella of, uh, again, I think like the, the core factors there are like moderation, pragmatism, uh, internationalism, um, which includes trade and like migration, internationalism. Mm-hmm. Um, again, like pro market, pro, I think they would say maybe pro regulation that makes sense. Like, um, you know, controlling for externalities, like market failures. It would say like attempting to be as possible, but I think a lot of people, a lot of neoliberals would just describe themselves as that, like we're just evidence-based um like whatever works uh i i do think that so like as this like co potentially coherent political group has formed excuse me i i do think some of the critiques of the cartoonish villain neoliberalism have come back and still potentially apply so mm-hmm. you you mentioned you mentioned uh you know, you think of neoliberalism as, as like, you know, corporatist protection. I, these aren't your words, but like, uh, you know, international, like expanding like international markets with protection for certain companies. And I think a lot of people think of like rigged trade deals. Um, I think that's something that, you know, again, like, I don't think that's an inevitability of internationalism. So I'm not mm-hmm. with the nationalists or like some socialists who think that that's like an inevitability of like cosmopolitanism. But that does seem to be a a pretty consistent trend with quote unquote pro-market reforms, uh, international efforts. And I think this is something where in my opinion, like a libertarian critique insight is that kind of this basic, um, and Sheldon Richmond may have, I may be stealing this from Sheldon Richmond, but like, or copying it from being pro market isn't the same thing as being yeah being pro market isn't the same thing as being pro firm. or being pro business isn't the same thing as being pro market mm-hmm. so um, and, and and again I think some neoliberals are aware of this like Paul Kreider on Twitter I think he describes himself as like a left neoliberal and I don't think it's just like he's a neoliberal that leans left. It's that he like actually like has like leftist concerns about these things and tries to like apply neoliberalism like that addresses or like controls for a lot of these left concerns. Um, and so and like leftist, neoliberal- leftist here means like working class as opposed to uh, big business when you say leftists, um, because some people would call a ne- neoliberal leftist. So it's interesting when the when the prefixes add up. So like a leftist neoliberal, this way is like somebody who recognizes the plight of the poor, um, but is also trying to be more international or more global. Yeah, I think maybe I don't, I don't know how he personally describes it, but I would imagine someone who like the left means again, like concern or emphasis on like the historically disenfranchised, the people mm-hmm. to be exploited, the environment, things that maybe like would stereotypically be called leftist concerns. It's sort of like those concerns, either moderating um, the neoliberal concerns or um, complementing them. Like think th- this actually is a good segue. So you mentioned like thing, you mentioned like bleeding heart libertarianism, mm-hmm. which um, and left libertarianism and like not, not really, they sort of came on the scene seemingly around the same time. And I think a lot of people mistakenly saw them as synonymous. Yeah. And, uh, you know, bleeding heart libertarian, I think 
there is overlap between bleeding heart, both bleeding heart libertarianism and neoliberalism. They're not synonymous, but like mm -hmm. there is some overlap and less libertarianism. So a couple less libertarians like Roderick Long or Gary Chartier also considered themselves bleeding heart libertarians. Um, but the difference between something like bleeding heart libertarianism, which I think most people who use that term, they mean something like liberalitarianism, like mm -hmm. Rick Lindsley calls it, uh, which Corey, Corey Mass Massimino put it this way, which I think is like really accurate. Like liberalitarianism is thing libertarianism and liberalism or leftism, depending on what you mean it as like moderating each other. It's almost like a compromise between the two. Mm -hmm. Whereas left libertarianism is seeing libertarianism and leftism as radicalizing one another. That makes sense. So and you may disagree with that characterization, but like I think that's that's an accurate way of how people who are in those groups see themselves. So like the left libertarians are almost always like explicitly anarchist, and I don't think that's by accident. It's because like the libertarianism and the leftism radicalize one another and are arguably like necessary for one another. Like to be a non-libertarian leftist is to compromise your leftism. <laughs> <laughs> and vice versa, because you're like, by definition, like legitimizing a example. Sorry, sorry, Chris, you cut out of it. You said by definition, you're you're legitimizing authority. Yeah, the. That's that's correct. Sorry, I cut out. But yeah, by you know the non-libertarian, I don't want to say authoritarian necessarily, mm -hmm. but that would include them. But like the non-libertarian leftist, it's like you're making exceptions or concessions for the state, which is you know is domination. No matter how democratic you make it, like involves a certain group of people, like with authority uh, ruling over others. Um, and so you're. It seems like it seems to me that that's a pretty like stark like compromise of your leftism to sort of being an apologist or making space or like incorporating inequality into your political theory or political philosophy. And maybe that's yeah, necessary yeah. for other reasons, but it, it seems to be less leftist than libertarianism. And likewise, if your libertarianism and your concern is something like freedom, you have to really think about what that means. Like, what does it mean to be expanding freedom to people? Like William Gillis says, like, your freedom is my freedom. Like, uh, you know, how free are we really, like, if a certain race of people dominate the conversation or dominate society, um, if people aren't free to express themselves, aren't free to, like, express their religious views, uh, aren't free to, like, work the kinds of things they dream and desire of. Uh, things they desire and like I'm I'm very much not a communist but I think like the communist insight or the goal of like communism is free time like mm -hmm. there's a lot of insight there which is like what we really want is just to be doing what we want to be doing um, and anything that like pushes us in that direction that doesn't violate the rights of others like is a good thing to me because I just I'm not a jerk and I want other people <laughs> to be, I want to be, I want other people to like enjoy at least the same level of freedom as I do. Yeah, no, I, I, I get that. And, and like you said, um, I've been deeply, deeply educated by edified by and learned a lot by, by reading from a lot of members of the C4 SS crew that, you know, you've named um, a lot of them. Um, where I think I depart on this is where there was a debate a few years ago. Um, sometimes I heard the word brutalist, but I think most often people were saying kind of thin versus thick uh, libertarianism. I think there might have even been like a paper that presented both sides that I read. And um, Dr. Walter Block, you know, often calls himself the moderate. And I, I, for the longest, I didn't know why he called himself the moderate. And then, it, you know, it kind of clicked in my head because he was very committed um, to the thin libertarianism. I think what you described, um, and again, the people might not describe it or they might describe it in that way, is the, the thick libertarianism is that if we have these ideals of liberty and freedom, if we say that, that we're for those things, then why are we restricting these 
to the political space or to to the legal infrastructure if that's this big thing we're critiquing why doesn't it you know apply to our metaphysics and our our ethics as well and where i see um my position is more aligned with dr blocks where it's like um a more thin libertarianism where the the most amount of our agreement is is going to be on the critique of the system of 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 striking you know at the root of the system as it is now and then you know what comes after is is going to be highly diverse and so being a more neutral and and you know there are obvious dangers with with being neutral which is like being being numb to the injustices of people who are of um, marginalized voices which is why I've, I've continued to always um listen but in in my professional field and elsewhere i've, I've just uh maybe it's that trait openness going back to the big five but i've always just found myself listening to both thin and thick libertarians. W one of another things that, that's been different. This is why before I think, um, I think I give you pause one time when I said my politics is everything that uh, Kevin Carson and Tom Woods would sit down on a table and agree to, um, because you know they occupy um, two ends of, of this of this kind of debate, and and I find things edifying from both sides. And in my in my personal life, like outside of libertarianism, I'm I'm also an Orthodox Christian. Um, I, I take seriously Jesus's call to to love all people and especially the way in which he's highlighted marginalized people in a way that I think some people who are cultural conservatives don't. Um, I'm an Orthodox Christian who grew up in in Los Angeles in a very liberal or progressive, however we're using that that space. You know, I didn't grow up in in a place surrounded by. Uh, a bunch of these people so so in many ways you know my my default my default position like I, I was a democrat you know up until high school i would have voted for barack obama in 2008 i was one week too young to vote but i definitely would have i was at pepperdine which was liberal by means of other conservative schools but it was conservative given the the california milieu and i was bumping Nas's track you know a black president you know on that day when there was a dead silent campus you know, because I believed some of the concessions he had. Even back then, I liked Ron Paul, and even back then, I liked Dennis Kucinich, who who I later worked for in um, in D.C. for a little bit. You know, who's clearly a Democrat, but um, you know, maybe closer to some of the the, the categories that that we have um, we have been describing. So, yeah, it's um, it it makes sense that if there are not religious commitments there need to be philosophical reasons or or otherwise like there has to be something brought to the table for you know why is it why are we doing what we're doing why why are we you know caring about all these people um so i yeah i i i appreciate like those writings and and those statements and 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 thinking critically like above all it's like thinking critically about how to be with more marginalized people. So I always appreciate that even, even if, and when I, I do differentiate from it. Yeah, sure. That's good to hear. I think that's like some good, um, good commentary. I, I'll be honest. Like I I've always found the like thin versus thin or thick versus thin libertarian, like commentary slash debate to be a little, like a little like nauseating. And like, mm -hmm. uh, it, it was one of those things where, it, a, I think like the height of it happened a little bit before like my concern with those issues. So mm -hmm. like I wasn't privy to a lot of those like earlier debates, but also like reading Charles Johnson's original piece just seems so like trivially obvious. I never like Charles Johnson who wrote libertarianism through thick and thin. Um, I, yeah. I never, I was not, I would not have expected the backlash that it produced. Um, and I think part of it, I may be getting my timelines a little mixed up here, but maybe some of it had to do with Jeffrey Tucker's yep. seemingly similar essay called Against Libertarian Brutalism, which I have not read in a long time and can't comment on, or I don't feel comfortable commenting on. Uh, but I will say that like my, I think the thin versus thick debate is a little like trivial uh, or unnecessary because I've, in my experience, I've never, I think there's like the thin caricature of what thick libertarians are saying, or this 
let me rephrase that. There's the thin advocate caricature of what the thick advocate are saying, which is that you're not a libertarian unless you accept my version of thick libertarianism, not even thick libertarianism, but my version. Mm -hmm. um, and that's never been the case, like in Charles Johnson's original essay and anytime someone has talked about it, like Gary Chartier's interview with Tom Woods, it's always like, it's not about telling some, it's not about like ruling people out or like gatekeeping about who and who isn't a libertarian. Also, Roderick Long's debate with with Walter Block. Um, it's either that like um, a libertarian, there are libertarian reasons to be concerned with certain issues, like mm -hmm. say like a culture of free speech. Um, like there are libertarian insights there. It's not as trivial as like which plant should you buy. <laughs> like there may not be libertarian insights there, but there may be libertarian reasons why you should care about like a culture of free speech or a culture of tolerance. Um, even if it's not written in stone required. Mm -hmm. um, it seems weird to say that there isn't like libertarian insights there uh, or libertarian reasons. And likewise, uh, I think someone, it may have been Jason, Jason Bias who wrote like, libertarianism is thin, but all libertarians are thick. Um, <laughs> That's funny. Which I, I hadn't uh, come across that. I follow him I, though. I, I hadn't come across that. I don't know if he still endorses that view, and uh, I hope I correct that it was in the piece of the history old block, which was really good, and it sucks it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but it more has to do with, like, if you think libertarianism is some kind of thin position, like, I think, like, like, like a lot of people would say, it's like, it's the non-aggression principle. Well, that in and of itself, like, requires, like, some, ex like, a lot of other explanation. Mm -hmm. like. What, it, what counts as aggression, who counts as being aggressed against. Like, those are a lot of, lots of just, like, is, does violating property count as aggression? Like, those are all things that, like, people just assume, but actually, like, require, like, additional support and argument for. Correct. And, it's, and that's totally fine that it does, actually. That's actually really cool that it does. Um, but because it requires, like, thickness from grounds, for what well, I think is to borrow Charles Johnson's terminology, like that in and of itself, like adds some thickness to it. Um, it's like inescapable. And, uh, but I, I don't, because I, I'm not willing to die on like the thick versus thin hill mm -hmm. personally, just because I just don't think, I feel like people are more arguing about like what I think people are often just talking past each other with it. Um, I think I, my, I agree. The only, There's a lot the of characterization. Position, Right. I mean, the only position I'll, I'll say that I do believe pretty strongly is that, again, like uh, this may be strategic thickness or um, I may be misremembering the terminologies, but I, I, I do agree with with Roger Long that there are there are things that there seem to be like libertarian insights to or there are lib you can appeal to libertarian reasons to do something. So, for mm -hmm. example, like I'm a vegan and it's not that there's like a necessary like one to one obvious connection between libertarian and reason, but you can appeal to a lot of libertarian insight and biases and values to make a case for veganism. To make a case that if you're a libertarian and concerned about non-aggression, you should also care about veganism or animal welfare um, more so, more clearly than you could say libertarians should care about chess or the main yeah. part. Like, <laughs> it seems like there are categories of issues that it's easier to find some sort of libertarian connection to. Um, and I think a lot of people, when you put it that way, will agree with that. Um, but, you know, that, I mean, that's, 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 that's really like my weak position on there. I think yeah. the re another reason I don't think it's like trivially, it's like very important is because like, you don't have to find like one-to-one -one or serious libertarian connections to have values. You should adopt certain values because they're good values. So like, even if you can't find a libertarian reason to be anti-racist, you should be anti-racist because that's a good thing in and of itself. So it's like, I, I don't have to rule, so I don't have to say someone's not a libertarian because they're a racist. I can just mm -hmm. say, you're just a crappy person and Shitty that's person, enough. Yeah. So like, that, that, that's really how I stand on those things. So like, I, when I get into arguments and people are like, you're just a thick libertarianism because you have like X, Y, Z opinion. It's like, yeah, because I'm a decent person and I've thought about these things, jerk. Like. Yeah, so, any, okay. any of these categories, in my opinion, they should be conversation starters, not closers. Like any of these, you know, whether it's like the things in our bios or, or any of these terms, 
you know, without getting uh, too postmodern, it's like these categories are going to be limited. They're going to be finite. They're not going to have all the explanatory power and these cultures are constantly changing. So again, like I told you, I identify with the thin, but everything that you just presented in terms of thick, I, I'm with. And like I said, I've adopted so much language. I think it was Gillis who said freed market originally. Correct me if I'm wrong. I, I've adopted that language. Charles Johnson has one of my favorite essays of all time, which is... Um, I think it was like on his Dispracanism, I'm butchering it vlog, but it, he says depoliticize rather than saying like privatize. And this goes to the neoliberal uh, discussion we we're having to depoliticize, to take away from the political means. And I found that language to be like freed and depoliticized. This is way more precise language. I feel like it's, it's you know, it's armed me with, with so many um, better tools. Um, uh, Gary is another great one too. Gary and Sheldon, are the most interesting to me because they're the ones who've, I think, been able to go between the camps and talk to everybody the most, you know? It, it, they seem like the ones who are able to communicate with with others as much. Like, like uh, Sheldon is with Scott Horton all the time, you know? And Scott Horton is, is almost pretty much like with squarely in the Mises, but he's kind of his own his own entity. And I've even Scott seen- what again, What'd you say? Scott's his own entity. Yeah. <laughs> like, like I've seen him discuss with Sheldon before, like, uh, he calls himself a left, like when he introduces him, he's like, he calls himself a leftist, but he wants to abolish the schools. He wants to do this. He wants to do that. So that like, even, uh, you know, Scott sometimes is uncomfortable with the way that, uh, that Sheldon would self describe, but you know, they're obviously like getting along. There's obviously like all these things that they agree on. It's funny. You brought up veganism. So we talked about it a little bit earlier and I didn't mention this, but, um, on the veganism point, I understand what you mean. Like chess, you know, I love chess, by the way, it's inanimate objects versus like animate beings, like things like in a more religious perspective, you'd say like these things with souls, with breaths of life, like there's some life in them. Um, from my Ethiopian Orthodox Christian side, I'd be with you. I don't know if you know this, but Ethiopian Orthodox Christians have mandatory fasting periods seven times a year, which add up to over 200 days of year. And during that period, there's a fast from a minimum midnight to noon. And then during the period where you're allowed to eat from noon to midnight, it's vegan. <laughs> like, and that's, that's the majority of Ethiopia. So we're talking about <laughs> potentially going there. Yeah. It, it, vegan cuisine, like automatically, like, you, you know, it's, it's already, you know, ingrained in the culture to, to have those appear. at the same time, you know, um, I'm, I'm definitely like a, a meat eater, you know, full disclosure on, on, on the other times. Um, but, but yeah, that's, that's interesting the way you said it, like, you know, you don't have to necessarily say that one is not a libertarian if they don't subscribe to or and and prescribe these uh, thick ideals but you can show how some of the the first principles behind libertarianism would lead somebody who is uh, not dumb who's thinking logically and intelligently and and trying to you know extend this this analysis with with good intent like not trying to be a crappy person you said or not trying to be a jerk like i like that yeah and even even the case you made like is even stronger than it needs to be because it, it, again it, it, it doesn't even need to follow logically for it to have insight that you know you can you can say um you know this may not follow logically from your principles of about being a libertarian but you can see how these like values these libertarian values are like related to these values and maybe the reason you have these libertarian values, the deeper reason, um, causes you to have these other ones. So it, it, it's even like sometimes a weaker case than that. And it's not just positions that I disagree with. The most famous thick libertarian advocate, even though she wouldn't describe herself with either of those terms, is Ayn Rand. Um, Interesting. She thought that the principles of libertarianism logically required, uh, you know, objectivism or what you yeah. do like a self-interested like a, her ethical egoism mm -hmm. i'm not an objectivist so i don't i don't want to like caricaturize her position but mm -hmm. i mean that's an example of like you can see that it's and that's an example where libertarians have no problem seeing the case there even if they disagree with it They're like okay i can see why she would come to those conclusions and make an interesting case there they don't feel threatened by that they but they only seem to be threatened by 
uh, other cases that maybe uh, they associate with political groups that they have bias against. Agreed. Agreed. I, I like that. I think everything uh, that we've you know come to has, has covered a number of topics where the importance of conversation, dialogue, listening to each other, reading the actual things that those actual speakers said instead of just you know hearing it secondhand and third hand and and not characterizing people. I think I think and hope that that this recording we've made will will push that kind of uh, that that peace and prosperity and and propping up of of marginalized peoples in a in a better a better way and uh, thank you for your for your time and and for joining me yeah thanks thanks for having me on Hinoch. i really appreciate it hopefully we can talk again there's i'm sure there's just a lot we didn't cover we just kind of went with the flow on this one it worked out pretty well yeah man anytime anytime bro anytime thank you so much cheers